happen. And now I just need to share. Everybody sees behind the scenes of us trying to prepare <laughs> for the talk on Facebook Live. And I'm a little early, so no complaining from anybody. And I just want to share this. And where is it? All right, you guys out there, we're going to start in just a couple minutes. Hold on. <laughs> Hold your horses. You should be meditating or something there, Marshall. Um, um. I'm centering myself. I was actually just checking my uh, my microphone, which is even more important. <laughs> I, sh I just like seconds before you, um, I went to uh, let you know that I was here. I went to, was going to Wikipedia. I'm trying to find a page. One of my editors just finished training right now. And I said, all right, so let's find something of interest to you to do because you know once they <clears throat> once they have finished training i have to give them something to do right away because otherwise they get kind of like oh well i know mm -hmm. i went to all that work and i'm kind of tired now and do something else and so i was trying to find something and i'm looking around for something that has to do with australia because she's in australia and i'm thinking of something to do with psychics because she's into psychics and i found a psychic page in australia named athena star woman okay nice <laughs> never heard of her and it's got like two citations and it's been up for um in 11 and so i set the page for deletion i said all right let's let's delete this puppy i can't <laughs> i mean it's only been 11 years and it still has two citations i think we can safely say this page needs to be deleted so that's what i was doing right before i see <laughs> deleting a psychic's wikipedia page i feel really horrible about it i'm going to lose a lot of sleep <laughs> I'm sure poor Athena Starwoman, who's long dead now, um, could care less. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably, probably could care less. Okay, so I'm going to tag you, and then I think we're ready to go. It just seems like everything's moving like glacial speed because, of course, I want it to move fast. Hmm. And. I mean, I put a new battery in my, this is the highlight of the day, putting a new battery in my um, mouse. Mm -hmm. That's important stuff. <laughs> I'll turn mine off and see if I can preserve the battery on mine. <laughs> we can't have that now, can we? <laughs> okay. How odd. All right, so it should be up on Facebook right now. And then so people who are um, watching, I'll be able to, there's a little bit of a, maybe 15 second delay, something like that. And so people will be able to ask questions if they want. And if so, I will read them off. And okay. then we can, okay, here's what I was trying to do, is just trying to edit it. And it went to live video or something. Went to, I mean, it went to some really strange thing. <laughs> I have some of the fastest internet in the world here. I am an hour from Silicon Valley, which is. Oh, okay, really? Yeah, you know, <laughs> should be should be amazing, blazing. But of course, it's only as fast as your computer. Yeah, 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 completely. They didn't tell me that. <laughs> All right, so hello everybody out there in Facebook land, the Facebook Live. This is Susan Gerbic. I'm doing another About Time Presents in conversation with Michael Marshall this morning. And this is a real thrill for me because I've known Michael Marshall for a very long time. I mean, we've all known of Michael Marshall more than <laughs> we may have known Michael Marshall, but we... I'm one of those few who call him Marsh. So, you know, <laughs> I, I got the end despite the fact that everybody calls him Marsh. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we're going to have a little chat today. Um, this has been a lot of fun for me to be able to do these about time com conversations with people because I have such an eclectic group of friends. And it's my chance to, ch to catch up with people and check in with them. And I think it's kind of fun for um, Facebook and other people out there to be able to catch up as well. 
I hate asking those same boring questions that everybody asks <laughs> when we write a Wikipedia page for somebody. And I say, okay, look at all these interviews they've done. Um, my team comes back to me all the time saying, okay, I listened to like six interviews, but they all said the same thing because they all asked him the same question. Not right, just yeah. not just you, but I'm just in general. It's like when you know you're going to do an interview, you've got your 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 Pat said, okay, how did you get involved with this? How long have you been involved with this? Mm -hmm. Tell me about your da, da, da. And you're like, you know, can you ask me something unusual? So maybe <laughs> we can branch out into something else. And I, I get that same thing too. I, I keep getting the same questions. I had an interview in New Zealand for New Zealand radio that hasn't been mm -hmm. released yet. And she went and read my Wikipedia page basically to me. I'm like, well, they could all read that themselves. Let's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want to try and get into something a little bit. Uh, we can actually hear someone's opinions rather than their uh, biography, I guess. Should be interesting. So I'm not going to go and I've given everybody your Wikipedia page so they can read it. And if they want to, <laughs> but give me like a give me a, like the elevator pitch, two floors of an elevator for who Michael Marshall is. Um, well, I'm the project director of the Good Thinking Society, which is a, a charity based in the UK. Uh, it's, I think, the only full-time sceptical activist charity in the UK, uh, run by Simon Singh, who I'm sure many of you uh, watching will uh, will know Simon's work. Um, I, I think I'm the only full-time sceptical activist in, in the country. It's my day job to investigate these things, to go undercover and see psychics, to campaign against homeopathy, to work with the media to get good stories into the press. Uh, and that's kind of what I do and have been doing as part of Good Thinking for six years now. And before that, I was doing it uh, with uh, Merseyside Skeptics for uh, 11 or 12 years and uh, I'm involved with more projects than I can even uh, remember, let alone uh, mention. I just like to throw myself at man as many different <laughs> things as possible and see what sticks, basically. <laughs> now, you are from the UK, as everybody can hear. And before my, my boyfriend, Mark Edward, just left for a doctor's appointment, he said, be nice. He's from the UK. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not sure where that went with that. But I think what he's trying to say is that you guys are so nice. You seem to be nice, <laughs> but in a usually in a sarcastic way, you know, if you catch the meaning afterwards, you realize, wait a minute, that bugger just insulted me and I didn't I've, catch that. I don't know what you mean. I don't know <laughs> what you mean at all. We're all an absolute delight. <laughs> absolutely delightful. But, uh, you know, you have a podcast that I absolutely adore. It's called Be Reasonable. And uh, we've done an interview talking about it. And it's a hour usually talk with somebody who is of the belief that they can heal or they have psychic abilities or some kind of thing that's outside of the scientific skepticism world yeah. and you, you're really careful about saying I'm not here to convince them I'm not here to argue with them I'm here to, to listen to what they're saying and and try to understand where they came from and why maybe they believe that yeah, yeah. I think it's really important. I think it's very easy for us uh, as, as skeptics to Ooh, see all the people wait, wait. we disagree with. I forgot to record. Hold on, hold on, hold oh. on. <laughs> oh my gosh, I forgot to record. I need to put a big old freaking button here that says, and this happened the other day, but it is on Facebook, so I can pull it. I love that disembodied voice. I gotcha. okay, okay, now we're being recorded. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, so that's no problem. So yeah, I'm just saying, I think it's quite easy as skeptics for us to see the people that we disagree with and, and to see them as so separate from us and they're people that we uh, shout down, they're people that we correct, the people we debate and own the debate and all that kind of stuff, I think is really counterproductive because a lot of the time we end up fighting straw men uh, versions of the arguments that we uh, that we disagree with because we never actually understand how people come to believe in these, uh, these other ideas. And, and if you ask someone in a debate scenario, you know, prove your ideas are right. They'll give you all the proof that they think is going to be proof to you, but they're not going to tell you what was proof to them because that, that's something a lot more personal. And I think if instead, if you have a conversation with someone and say, so, okay, could you tell me about this idea? Could you tell me how you came to believe in this? Could you tell me what you think about this? They'll much more, they'll be much more likely to give you what was actually persuasive to them. And I think if we're going to be uh, involved in trying to encourage people to, to sense check their ideas, to, to question their ideas, we need to 
have them questioning the things that were persuasive to them, not just questioning the things they're trying to use to persuade us. Because in a lot of those times, you know, you talk to someone who's a creationist, they don't believe in uh, in creationism because they really think the flagellum is such a, uh, a remarkable thing that couldn't have evolved by chance. That's not what convinced them. What convinced them is something else. And it might have been their biblical views. It might have been the, the person in their life who they respected a lot, who was also a creationist, who had a personal relationship with them. The flagellum is just what they throw you to to try and bat you away but it's not what actually convinces them and i think it's it's really important we try and get down to the brass tacks of, of what really is persuasive to people what people actually think and, and once we understand what people actually think and i think also have a dialogue with them um we just arm ourselves with with so much more information and and as well i think that information the conversation can lead us to a point of compassion where we can understand that the people that we disagree with aren't monsters uh, and similarly the person I'm talking to who might believe that they might have a harmless belief that they that they believe that aliens visited us in the 15th century, like one chap that I spoke to. But they may also might also have a, a very harmful belief that uh, AIDS doesn't exist, which is the, one of the most recent views I put out. Um, and lots of those people on the full gamut of how harmful their belief will be. Um, I might be the only sceptical person they've had a, convers a proper conversation with. They've had arguments, they've had debates, but in terms of a proper conversation, they may have never have talked to somebody who disagrees with them about this and, and had an, an elongated, mm -hmm. respectful and polite, but still firm and challenging conversation. Uh, and so at the end of that conversation, they might come away thinking, well, I thought all sceptics were horrible, aggressive, you know, patronising, but that guy seemed all right. Maybe, maybe they aren't all evil. Maybe there is something to this. Maybe they're a bit more receptive to, to think about things. So I think, yeah, humanizing the people we disagree with helps us on, on, on both sides, I think. I totally agree. Richard Saunders talks about this kind of thing all, often he, on the skeptic zone. He, he, he thinks it's real important for skeptics to visit maybe a, a fair, you know, like a psychic fair or what does he call them? Whole paycheck or no, what does he call them? Mind body wallet festival. Mind body wallet yeah, festivals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And to go in and see what it is that people are selling, what's the new thing and, and have conversations with people. Don't argue with them. Don't, you know, you know, just ask them. So this product does this and, and, you know, just how do you know it does this? Mm -hmm. And, and just to learn how to have a conversation with them, as you say, it's out of our comfort zone. But I think it is important that we, we listen. You know, the people that you talk to on your show who believe in, you know, um, homeopathy or um, witches, their witches or whatever it is mm -hmm. their thing is, you know, they may listen to the show and go to other episodes and go, wow, that person over there, now they're crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look at that it, one. It He's a flat happens. earther with it, you know. <laughs> you kind of wonder. Um, Brian Dunning talks about a lot that how to talk to other how to talk to people is one of the first things you have to understand is that that we don't have the same vocabulary necessarily. Mm -hmm. I mean we're both speaking English, but their idea of theory, energy, uh, evidence is different to them than it is to the scientific skeptic community. And if we can't even agree on what we're saying, then how can we have a conversation with these people? Well, I think that's it. And I think it's also about listening as well and being genuinely interested because I think it's very easy for us sometimes to have conversations with people we disagree with. And what mm -hmm. we're actually doing is just waiting for a, a chance in the conversation to present them with a piece of information. And, and you know, I, I've done it in this in my, myself in the past before I started doing being reasonable that they're, they're talking and you're not listening. You're just waiting for a gap in the conversation to hit them with a fact. <laughs> and that isn't a conversation. You know, that's because when you yeah. do that, they aren't going to be listening to that fact. They're just going to be waiting as well. Whereas if you have a genuine interest in what they're saying, you can actually ask much more challenging questions and you can ask it in a way that isn't challenging in the sense of aggressive. It's challenging in the sense of stretching. You know, it's, it's um, I'd like to understand what you're thinking and understand what you're saying. And I want to follow what you're saying. But when I try and do that, I've come across this problem here. So how do you get over this problem? Could you help me understand this? And if you're asking for that kind of collaboration, people are much more likely to, to, to go with you on that journey. And when you, you know that there's a, a brick wall coming up if you take a certain left-hand turn. You can get people to take that journey with you 
and they are confronted you know they stumble upon this this problem for themselves rather than you kind of dropping a brick wall in their path and uh, and hijacking them you know so i think having that kind of structured collaborative genuinely interested conversation i think is really valuable but you can't fake it you can't pretend to be interested just in order to try and surprise them later on with the fact you have to genuinely want to hear what they have to say and be genuinely trying to think about how you understand that and how you challenge it and how you kind of interpret it for yourself i agree i agree i i've been talking a lot to uh people who are believing in uh, psychics we've been mm. having one-on-one -on -one conversations with them they'll they'll post on a a psychics wikipedia uh, wikipedia gosh it's on my brain <laughs> facebook page and they'll say something that maybe is a challenge um like they'll it feels like they're starting to doubt something or or they'll make some kind of statement and then i or somebody on my team because i have a team of people will we'll talk to them and we're trying to do it in like in a private message and we'll say that's really interesting what you said I was wondering what you thought about this or, you know, just having a conversation with them. We're trying to never say all psychics are fake. Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. We're like this specific psychic in this specific circumstance. Can you explain to me a little bit more? You know, that's really interesting or, or, and they're having these long conversations with me. And then we slowly maybe will get out to the point where, you know, they'll ask, well, have you ever seen a psychic that you, you know, that you found to be real? And I, it'll take me a while to get to that point, but, you know, basically mm -hmm. I'll say, well, you know, I've been really looking for a very long time. And every time we try to, we think we find something, it doesn't pan out, you know, and it's very mm -hmm. frustrating. And, you know, and, and I think you're right to having these conversations without being a tacky, I think yeah, it makes yeah. it so that they'll have more conversations with you later, whenever they have something uh, they have a question they'll say well you know that guy michael marshall was really nice i've been hearing about this covid uh mm. thing maybe i'll ask him maybe he'll give me a good some good yeah it's about yeah. kind of um respect and, and rapport i think if you can build a rapport with somebody then then they're invested in the conversation and it's why some of the ways that i do the conversation on be reasonable and, and obviously it's only about an hour long so i'm not going to change any minds in the course of that hour anyway that's not how it works as, as you well know um but a lot of the conversations i have on be reasonable the first 15 20 minutes won't be particularly challenging because the important thing is to try and build that rapport so that they trust that the conversation you're having is is a genuine conversation conversation you're willing to listen you're willing to engage you're not just kind of shut them down whenever they say something you disagree with and i think once you've built that kind of rapport it's you build up credit that you can then start spending later in the conversation to say well look i know that you know you and i've been chatting for a while but this bit here come on i'm not sure about that could you give me a little bit more on that and i think once once people kind of understand that you're there to be respectful in the conversation and you're not just another of the skeptics that they'll have met who say well you know uh, homeopathy is a tax on the gullible and all these people it's just you know the darwin uh, darwin awards or you know it's it's natural selection uh, in in practice and all that stuff just i always hear that stuff and think do you think that's changing anyone's mind do you think there's anybody out there who thought well i thought i could cure my cancer with this but now you've called me gullible I'm going to think twice. They're just going to see you, if, especially when we're, we're talking to people who might already be predisposed to assume that skeptics are patronizing and aggressive and dismissive and all those things. Um, if you act in ways that merely confirm that bias, they're even less likely to listen to you because they, well, I thought skeptics were all patronizing. And then this person came along and was patronizing. <laughs> I don't have to change my view. So I, I think when we confirm their pre-existing biases, all we do is is uh, distance ourselves from having any chance of an effect on on their decision making, mm -hmm. on their thought process, on their lives, really. I think, yeah, by by subverting that bias and, and being reasonable <laughs> by being be, nice. Be reasonable. You know, be Ooh, yeah, nice absolutely. segue. <laughs> we but have no, it's, a, it's why the show is called that, you know? Well, we have a, I have, talk to a lot of people you know we're all in a journey and everybody's different places and we have people coming to scientific skepticism and they're trying to argue with people about things and they keep throwing links at them and mm. i'm like nobody's reading those links dude you know so <laughs> they just think here's a solution you know yeah, yeah. here's a link and then they they say but and then when i talk to them i say how effective was it they say well they didn't read anything you know or they'll say well, they just threw links back at me. And I'm like, yeah. well, did you read those? <laughs> well, no, it's a bull, it's bullshit. And you're like, well, 
what was the that was there was no purpose in that that was just a waste of your time and their time so yeah and it's not a good faith conversation at that point you have to be genuinely genuinely there you have to be genuinely present in the conversation and i think you know people and i i went through it as well when i first got into skepticism you know 11 12 years ago something like that i went through the same kind of period of, and it's exciting that you find out all this stuff that's out there in the world is is based on such flimsy foundation and is is, is you know phony as bullshit all is all this stuff and you want to tell tell the world all about it mm -hmm. and i sort of characterize that a little bit as kind of like a skeptical adolescence is that you kind of have this period of everything's so exciting and you want to write the world and tell everyone how how wrong they are um but i think if you stick around in the movement for long enough and you genuinely want to to change something to make the world a bit better for people if it's not just about being right but about actually trying to change things i think you come through that adolescence into a a, a, a more of a phase where you think well all of this stuff isn't true just having the knowledge is the easy bit you know finding out what's true and what isn't is basically fairly easy on, on a lot of these topics the hard bit is actually trying to change how the rest of the world engages with it and once you th start seeing your role as being there to try and protect people from that knowledge to educate people to help them sense check um that's when you start looking at what tactics what tactics you're employing and whether those tactics are uh, are actually useful and mm -hmm. you know the people who are it's very easy when you first get into skepticism to come up with a list of logical fallacies uh, and think, right, as soon as I identify a logical fallacy in the argument someone's uh, making, I've won the argument. I just need to name that logical fallacy back at them. But <laughs> that doesn't change anyone's mind. If you say that's an argument from popularity to someone who's saying, well, all these people are going to psychics, can they all be wrong? So, well, that's an argument for popularity. If they aren't well versed, as you say, in the voc vocabulary, they're going to be like, well, so what if it's an argument for popularity? I don't even know what that means. Maybe I do know what it means, but I don't care. All I know is, I believe it because so many other people do. And you're a jerk. You have to go beyond. Yeah, absolutely. You've <laughs> got to go beyond just pointing and pointing a finger at their argument, and instead try to actually unpick their argument and, and show the bones of it in a way that mm -hmm. they can understand through a collaborative effort. I think. Absolutely. So let's let's move to one of my favorite topics: psychics. You've had <laughs> yeah, you've yeah. been involved in so many things, but you know I got to ask about sally morgan can you tell everybody who sally morgan is because here in america she's not a thing uh we only no, know her first, first well, she did try and tour america but i don't oh, she think tried. Uh, <laughs> yeah i don't think her, her tour caught on quite as much so sally morgan uh probably still is the biggest touring psychic in the uk i mean obviously there isn't there are no touring psychics in the uk right now because there are no touring right, yeah. anythings in the uk right now uh, but even going into lockdown she probably was the the biggest touring psychic in the uk at the height of her career she was maybe doing 200 plus uh events a year 200 250 events a year so touring quite uh, that's quite a lot heavy. yeah and she was playing out to theaters that would have you know a thousand seats in, in in a lot of them at the height of her career um over the last couple of years she's been playing slightly smaller theaters she's been doing slightly fewer dates for whatever reason that might be um and while she's been out there kind of doing the the various uh doing the the stage performance that she does um she's attracted a huge amount of criticism not least from us um i think it was 2011 2012 we issued her with a million dollar challenge around halloween because it was so important we oh, felt i remember that, uh, that. that yeah was we even brilliant. we had the whole test set up ready yeah, and, you're like and show up yeah that's exactly it and we we um the test that we had was based entirely on what she does in her live show. We, we watched her. I've been to see her live three, four, five, maybe more times than that. We watched what she did in a live show. We set up a test based on an exact part of her live show and said, you know, this, this test is here. This is a preliminary test for the Million Dollar Challenge. We're in Liverpool. You were playing Liverpool the night before Halloween. So on Halloween, we were saying, you're, you're in this city right now. You're basically in the hotel. We, were, we had a, a conference room booked in the hotel next to her venue. So that we said, just come along and take the test. And we even said, if you think this isn't a fair test, come along and explain to us why. Because we think this is really important. You know, when it comes to the allegations that were made about how she may have been getting information this way or that way, or whether the, the piece of paper that she has in her prayer card ball, uh, whether those are being used in her stage show or not, which were other allegations that were, that were being made, all of that stuff would go away if she would have just taken the test. And we think it's really important because having been to lots of her shows, I've seen the, the mothers in the audience who've been told, that the the toddler who drowned in, the, in a swimming pool um, is back and is speaking to her. And, and I've seen Sally Morgan possessed by the spirits of some of these dead children. And at this point, when you're 
possessed by the spirit of a dead child in front of a, an audience, um, you really either you are genuinely possessed. And if you are doing if you're sounding like a child in those situations, that's because the spirit is genuinely possessing you or you are deciding to make to do an impersonation of a dead child in front of a grieving mother in front of an audience of you know a, a thousand people or something and i can't think of a third explanation there may be a third explanation for it but it strikes me that either you're genuinely being possessed or you're faking being possessed i don't know that it's even easy to accidentally fake being possessed because if you're at this, this point so i don't know but all this stuff was going on and we said to resolve all of this just come along and take the test and i'm not psychic I have no psychic powers. But if I really was psychic and I was doing a stage show where I was genuinely possessed by the spirits of toddlers and bringing parents to tears in front of a paying audience, if there was any possibility that parent in the audience might leave my show thinking I was faking it at all, I would take every single test you gave me because I couldn't live with the idea that someone could think I was so ghoulish as to, as to fake that. So I, I think it's really important that if there are genuine psychics out there, they do engage with the tests. And if they can pass the test, then great, we've got a whole new field of science to study. And suddenly we can start uh, exploring that with some, uh, some real vigor, having been based on some solid data. Unfortunately, that data's been missing because everybody who's taken the test like that so far has failed to reproduce any psychic abilities under test conditions. But um, so this is, this is stuff that's been going on with Sally for, for quite some time and, and other psychics up, in the UK way. too. She, didn't, she show. didn't show up, unfortunately. We, we got a message, I think, from her, her agent uh, saying that she's got better things to do than to take any test. And uh, unfortunately, that's been Sally's attitude towards skeptics for, for a long time, really, is to uh, rather than engage with them. There was a, a, a skeptical activist who was uh, standing outside of her show, handing out leaflets, just explaining some basic ways that someone could learn to, to do cold reading saying, if you spot some of these techniques, maybe they're signs of cold reading. If the psychic you see doesn't do any of these techniques, maybe they're genuine, you know, but just look out because these are red flags. And rather than engage with that person at a, at a kind of conversational level, a respectful level, Sally Morgan's team, which was consisted of her, her husband and her son-in-law, uh, came out to essentially harass and intimidate uh, the, the skeptical activist who was doing it. And I think that, that speaks volumes, unfortunately. This is why we love Marsh. Just listen to you. I could just sit here and listen to you. I mean, that's, that's brilliant. The way you, the way you are so compassionate about it, um, the way you're looking at it, like either it's this or it's that. So which one is it? I mean, you know, maybe it's a different approach also the UK has to take than the Americans do because of libel laws and things as well. So, I mean, that is obviously a concern, but I think also it's 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 intellectually honest for for me to to sit and say um, in any given psychic show that I've seen that I can't tell you they're not psychic. All I can tell you is what they did and how well that resembled magic tricks. And it might well be that they just got really unlucky that the the, the psychic ability that they have so closely resembles a magic trick as to be indistinguishable. Um, that would be incredible. And it's one of the things that when I give talks about psychic abilities, I say this to my audience, is that if you are struck by psychic abilities tonight, I would strongly avoid doing anything in your live, genuinely psychic show that exactly resembles a magic trick. Because I've seen psychics doing the, the prayer card uh, routine. This is something mm -hmm. Sally Morgan does, in fact. Sally's love letters, write on a piece of paper, put it in a ball, that goes on stage, and she will tell you what's written on a piece of paper and answer the question without looking at the, the, the piece of paper. Um, and I've seen lots of other psychics do this. And this looks like a billet read, which I'm sure Mark could be able to tell you 20 yes, different ways of uh, telling yeah. what's inside that piece of paper. One ahead, I think, is what they also call it, too. Yeah, well, that's just that's one of the methods. One's here. The, the what, you're reading the, the one that well. you think is up here. And yeah, bu billets and... Yeah, I mean, there's other, there's other methods. There's, there's envelopes that go uh, translucent when you wet them. So you dip your thumb in a, in a glass of water and rub them across the front and Ooh. you can see straight through. There's lots of different ways it can be done. Now, it could be done during during using genuinely psychic ability. But if you're genuinely psychic, just avoid doing anything that looks exactly like a well-known <laughs> magic trick because your audience is going to get confused as to whether what you're doing is genuine or exploitative. Um, and I think that's kind of my advice to, to psychics, really. But when it, when it comes to the compassion for, for, for psychics as well, I think when it comes to the audience, I think one of the reasons oh, yeah. I advise people to go to, to a, a psychic show at some point in, in their life to go along and actually see this stuff is because it gives you a huge amount of compassion for the audience. Because I've, I've never been, I've been to dozens, I've no idea how many different psychic shows I've been to. And I've never been in an audience, I don't think, where at least one person at some point wasn't in tears believing every word of it. Oh, yeah. Um, 
And that's why I think we need to do this because it's heart wrenching. Not genuine then that person is being exploited either knowingly or unknowingly by the psychic or exploiting them. You know, you could be psychic. You could not be psychic and still think you're psychic and still be exploiting people. So it gets into, into complex layers there. But if it's not genuine, people are being genuinely harmed by it. And that's why I think we need to, to be there, not just to shout when, when people are wrong and to shout how right we are, but to protect the people who are being harmed by this stuff. And to, to, because I think in my worst moment, when the worst things have ever in the world have happened to me, I may be vulnerable to exactly the same kinds of things. And I'd like someone else there to say, mate, you're not in the best place to judge this right now, but I think you're being, uh, you're being lied to, or you're being deceived or you're being misled here. I think that's the social responsibility of, of skeptics really. And so your involvement with Sally Morgan, is there any updates of what's going on with that, that you can talk uh, about? We're, we're always looking. We're always we're always looking for not just with Sally, but other touring psychics in the UK. We're always looking to see um, what's what's happening, what's what's worth uh, looking into and, uh, and, and what we can do to understand if it's genuine or not. So, yeah, we're always uh, always on the lookout. Mm, OK, so uh, QED, let's talk briefly about what QED is. I have <laughs> gone in 2014. Mark and I both spoke there. I'd love to go back. I think I'll everybody would like to go back <laughs> at this point but i mean you took a you took a, a year off 2019 was the year off and yes 2020 was supposed to be your year on yeah but that had to be canceled can you tell yeah. everybody what that is because there's a lot of people who don't know what qed is they know what the amazing meaning is and they know what q um Psycon is but this is a little different yeah so so qed is uh the grassroots skeptical skeptical uh, event that we run um it, it originally started as kind of a, a project from the merseyside skeptics and the greater manchester skeptic society it's kind of grown out of that a little bit more and, and more of the people who run qed aren't involved in either group so we kind of see it as its own separate thing now um but it's a, it's a huge event that we run in manchester almost every year we do as you say we didn't last year and unfortunately we're not gonna do this year we will again next year um and it's just it's always a really fun weekend because we have so many different things going on at once and we get six or 700 people together from all around the world come in and we have a, a main room where there's always talks on. We have a side room where there's always panels and we have another room where it's all, where there's always podcasts on. There's another room where there's always workshops on and it's just, it's kind of like a skeptical festival really. And um, the, the, the really, the thing I love about it most is just how much of a community it feels is that everybody who comes to QED sort of feels part of it and feels like, they're there to bring a little bit of something to QED and, and it just it all it always feels like a really lovely weekend like a really lovely environment and um, it, it really energizes me for, for being part of uh, part of the community I think really so yeah we're looking forward to, to doing it uh, in 2021 and we're, we're so annoyed that we the year that we took off last year um, had we decided to go ahead last year and then take this year off we'd have been in a different situation with uh, with coronavirus but um, we've unfortunately had to have a, a two-year hiatus rather than just a single a single year. <laughs> It, these events are so they're very social and I just did an interview and I'm trying to think if it was Pontes or if it was Andras from the ESP they were talking mm. about how at QED you guys don't use a green room because you want the uh, speakers to mingle to be mm. out there and mingle and I said well nobody told me there wasn't a green room <laughs> <And they> said, <laughs> well that's not your nature Susan to not be out mingling I said well a mm. green room is great if you need to get a free meal or something and you know you just need to go grab something really quick a banana or something but I, I i didn't realize that you guys that was um like important well yeah it feels that way but I, that that's a focus is that there is no green room the the speakers mingle with people all the time well it was really important to us that we don't have a a, a vip experience so there's not a vip experience for the speakers and you can't buy a vip experiences that basically everyone is there together and, and there are there's spaces that if a speaker needs time to prepare then the space is available for them but we don't think about it in the sense of a green room because you know we've all been to all sorts of different conferences i'm sure in the past not just skeptical but other ones as well mm -hmm. where the speakers and you know a benighted few um essentially disappear into a, a side room and the only time you ever see the speaker is when they're on stage and that's just totally the the wrong ethos for what we mm -hmm. want not only for qed but also for for the community feel of skepticism is what what we really want is that 
everybody is in this together. And the person who's up on stage right now is going to be hanging around just as much as everyone else. And this, you know, the person you're hanging around with this year, if they go on and do a lot of work in the in, in the skeptical field over the next couple of years, they're going to be on stage. And it's no difference. There's no barrier to entry. There are no levels of skepticism. We're really against the idea of skeptical celebrities because I think it's really important for us that we elevate ideas rather than personalities because um, as we've all seen over the last God knows how many years, personalities are fallible. Mm -hmm. People are people and people make mistakes and people sometimes turn out to, to not be great and not be good actors. Um, and if you base a movement on the people rather than on the ideas, then you're pegging it to foundations that are fallible. Um, whereas if instead we're saying this is all about the community and the community is everybody who is here, everybody who wants to drive this in the right direction, everyone who wants to make this a, a friendly, safe, fun, collaborative environment. Um, if that's what your focus is, then I think you, you grow a much healthier movement, I think, that way. And, and certainly in the UK, that's kind of how skepticism works. Really, we don't have top down organisations who run events. It's very much kind of you want to do something, go on and go ahead and do it. And if you want some help with it, talk to someone else who's doing it. And, and eventually we start to sort of coalesce and, and put things together. But there's no there's no kind of uh, gatekeepers, I think. And mm -hmm. I think that's Very quite, grassroots. A, quite a useful thing. Grassroots all the way up. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, it, it has its downsides because I think if you have if you do have a very top down organization, it can be much easier to uh, to push out um, activist campaigns if you've got a structure already there. And, and we we don't have that. And the activist campaigns we push out, we we do by saying who wants to join us on this and who wants to help out. And you kind of have voluntary time to, me to, to manage and measure that way, um, which is a little bit of a drawback, but a totally worthwhile drawback, I think, for the huge gains we get of, of having such a, a collaborative community. Mm -hmm. oh, well, speaking of collabor collaboration, I wanted to um, I wanted to talk about this, and I was going to use this timeline of how important it is to be involved with in a global sense, you know, having people collaborate across the uh, even language barriers in some cases, mm. but just to collaborate against with other people. And I was going to say that uh, recently there's this healer and some people may know what I'm talking about or where I'm going to go with this, but there is this healer in, in New Zealand. Her name is Jeanette Wilson, mm. healer and uh, psychic. And she has a lot of other things. I think she had a TV show at one point. And what happened is the, the New Zealand skeptics got together and said, let's go attend her show. Let's go see what she's all about. And they went and they were able to write up some you know, reports about what they saw and what they what what they experienced, and they came out saying that she's anti-vax, she's anti-mammogram, mm -hmm. she's, um, you know, sporting a lot of healing things that really aren't. I think her her stick is is that she channels a dead doctor who then tells you what's wrong with you. The doctor tells you tells her what's wrong with you, and then she heals by using Reiki or healing. Touch yeah, or yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Something like that. So what happened is the New Zealand skeptics, that's our New Zealand psychic. Okay, so that could have just stayed right there in that little world. And probably nobody outside of New Zealand would have known anything about it. And, and that's it. But what ended up happening is this particular person, psychic, wanted to go to the UK because I think she's from Manchester or Liverpool. Yeah, or she is. Oh, I'm not sure where in the UK she's from. Someplace she, she wanted to tour Manchester. there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Australia, New Zealand, and the UK are really strict about having people who come over and decide they're going to talk about anti-vax and encourage mm. people not get vaccines. So that's kind of something that's not necessarily in the United States, but in those areas. So the New Zealand skeptics let you guys know, let you specifically, I think, know yeah. about Jeanette Wilson's going to be coming to the UK. She has these tour dates. She wants to come and she's going to, of course, she's going to talk about anti-vax and healing and such. And you said... I don't know about that. So you did. What did you briefly do? Yeah, well, so I uh, looked at uh, all the different venues that were going to be hosting her and um, looked at kind of uh, what sort of venues they were and actually wrote uh, letters to every one of those venues saying, just so you know, you probably don't realize who's coming along here because they've just booked a room and you don't really sort of necessarily look for all that. But here are the types of claims that Jeanette Wilson is going to make in your establishment. And here are the here's evidence of her having said these things before. Um, and so wrote to every one of those venues said, so it's, it's up to you as to whether you're happy to go ahead with this but we think that she's very likely to make claims that would break uh break sort of um advertising type laws trade trading standards type laws and, and even go as far as she has in the past of breaking laws around the cancer act 
Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're comfortable with your venue being the host of some claims that are going to be uh, breaking the Cancer Act. Um, and the other thing that Jeanette Wilson does is, does is she uh, films all of her healing sessions and puts those up online and uses those. Uh, she sells a lot of kind of um, purple wheat powders and various of the supplements. And she uses the, the videos as a way of demonstrating how powerful you are when you have these different supplements and then sells you the supplements as well. So we're just saying that she's going to record videos. Some of those may break the Cancer Act. They're going to be in your venue. Those videos are going to go up online with your venue in the background of those videos. And these videos are going to be seen by people who may currently be having chemotherapy or something and and may choose not to have their their cancer treatment because of the claims being made in these videos. Are you comfortable with that? We actually saw quite a few, quite a few. And I I called a lot of the venues as well. And and quite a few of them, you know, thanked me for bringing it to their attention because they didn't want this kind of thing. They're just a hotel. They don't, they're not there to make health claims. Quite a lot of them said that they weren't going to allow her to use the space or they said um, that they are going to allow her this time, but then they won't ever allow her again and things like that. Uh, and then when the event went forward, the, the, the first couple of events were in the, the same kind of uh, area that I live in, so in the world, so near, near Liverpool. What is she thinking? What was she thinking? She started there. Um, <laughs> so I went along to the first event. I didn't actually buy a ticket because I thought she might recognise my name. Um, but I went along just to see how many people at the event and saw there was like 15 or, or fewer than that. So it wasn't a great turnout. A friend friend of mine went along to her second event and apparently she opened the second event with a long uh, rant about how uh, evil Michael Marshall is and how evil <laughs> I am at, uh, at bringing the claims that she's making. Congratulations. Well, yeah, absolutely. Love it. Uh, but this is the thing. If you're going to make claims that are well documented, um, it's, not, uh, it's not evil to point out to venues the dangers of these claims and to give the venues the choice of saying whether you want to, to be the host of these claims or not. And it turns out lots of venues wanted nothing to do with that kind of claim, which I think is pretty, pretty good on them, really. And they started cancelling? Yeah, I think I forget how many of them did cancel. Some of them cancelled and others said, uh, we won't cancel this booking, but she won't be able to book with us ever again. And, and uh, the, the company she booked through would be essentially blacklisted from those venues, I believe. I, I, and, I'm not 100 percent sure. But I think and then you said. and then the media caught caught wind of this. Well, so then, then I reported this to, uh, first of all, the local uh, local newspaper here in uh, here in Liverpool and explained that these claims had been made because they, they were made in the Liverpool area. They reported uh, some of the things that she was saying. Um, that end, ended up being, I think, escalated to a national level newspaper as well. Uh, and so now we have you know, attention that is going to follow her when she starts turning up to places to make these claims. And of course, once it was published in one newspaper, I was then able to send it to anywhere that hadn't cancelled to, to find their local newspapers and say, this person who was covered in this Liverpool Echo article is coming to you next week. Do you want to do something about this? And I think we got a love few other this. bits of coverage there as well. I love it's, it. It's, it's a good way of showing how you can sort of generate um, a little bit of attention and worthwhile attention. It's not, you know, it's not unfair attention. It's genuinely fair attention. And once you have that attention, use it to, to point out to other places the, the dangers that uh, that, are, that come from these kind of misleading claims. And you can find that the media will pick up on this and that other venues will then pick up on the media attention to it. And it you can really start to, to get somewhere just by shining a light on things. And this is really all I was doing is just is shining that light on where the, the hand. They don't before. want any light shine on them. That's for sure. Yeah, so, the, so then the story gets picked up by the Skeptic Zone with uh, Richard Saunders. And then, so it's gone from New Zealand to the UK to Australia. So, of course, I listen to the Skeptic Zone and, and I'm listening to it. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder if this Jeanette Wilson has a Wikipedia page. Because mm. once they can get a Wikipedia page, then the story is magnified. I mean, then it's like a one-stop shop. Anybody was to Google her name, they, the media, the uh, venues, anybody would instantly be able to find out who this person is and what claims they're making. So... It comes to me and I'm like, yeah, this sounds like a good story. And because of the media attention that you guys have gotten in New Zealand and the UK, because I can't, we can't do a Wikipedia page just because we want to make a Wikipedia page. There's certain standards, but what you guys had generated made it possible for us to write the Wikipedia page. And then what happens, and I I like this little element too, I can add on the the editor who (laughs) wrote the Wikipedia page is in Iowa. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's just some, it's somebody who's part of my group who's mm. who's uh her name is april hoy hi april but <laughs> the idea is is that it just spreads even further so here it comes into the midwest of of america and somebody out there who says okay i'll take this one on and she writes wikipedia page it goes up about a month or so later jeanette wilson finds out she has a wikipedia page mm. and she lit 
a fuse. She went onto Wikipedia. She was furious. She claimed that we were lying, that Michael Marshall was a horrible person, and that, oh, oh, the Good Thinking Society wrote the Wikipedia page, which really pissed me off because, <laughs> no, they had not. The GSOW yeah. project had written that Wikipedia page. Yeah, I had and nothing to do with it, yeah. <laughs> nothing to do with it at all. And uh, I think we told you when we were done. Yeah, and yeah. so that was, and I think that's where she saw it. She saw it on your Facebook feed or I don't know, something. So she was having a fit. Now, GSOW didn't get involved at all. We just stood back and watched the conversation she was having with the normal editors of Wikipedia who were trying to explain to her, you cannot delete your Wikipedia page. It is not your Wikipedia page. You cannot wipe out sections of Wikipedia. If you if you say they are lying, and then we need to have something to, you know, just other than you saying that they that they're lying. So yeah, then especially I said, when the claims in, in it were all based on media reporting in, in well-established media exactly. organizations, not just so random I, blogs or anything. Yeah. Exactly. I it wasn't it was these are reliable sources. So I went to you and I went to the New Zealand skeptics and I said, look, this lady's raising a fuss. And we're saying that she's anti uh, this and anti that and she's anti-vax and and these are the claims that are being made about her. And I just want in good conscience to know, can you guys go back and look at your research and just double check that that is what you found mm. and you got back to me and the New Zealand skeptics got back to me and said absolutely what we with the reporters are reporting is what we found and I said okay yeah. great thank you I feel better about that so then we <laughs> took it a little further and one of the New Zealand board members Russell he decided he, he wrote to me he's one of my GSOW editors also and he wrote to me he says you know I'd really like to do something more with this Jeanette Wilson because I think he was one of the people who went to her originally and so he was constantly getting these emails from her come back we're gonna do a show and you know just yeah he kept you know these psychics are reaching out to skeptics for some reason not knowing they're reaching <laughs> out and so I said sure let's let's put together a sting and um, what we were going to do is we thought she was going to do readings because she used to do like readings readings yeah yeah she did yeah, yeah. reading readings but she's moved away from that now so um i and a few other new zealand skeptics got into a uh, webinar with her that went onto facebook and we recorded everything and at the very end and it was all meditation and all this other stuff and then at the very end um i asked her in the character that i was playing because i had a fake facebook page and I asked her, um, I've been interacting with her for the full two hours on Facebook. Mm. And I asked her at the end, so tell me about, you know, I'm over here in America and we've got over 100,000 people dead. And, you know, do you see, what do you see happening with COVID and what do you ha see happening with the vaccine? Well, she went on for 16 minutes, mm. all recorded about how it's going to go away and that she had the supplement that you could buy that would coat your lungs and keep you from getting i mean she was making claims that were egregious you know anti-5g anti-vaccination yeah yeah on and on and on so you know we ended that we ended that sting it was just my way of confirming that we really did know that she was making these claims and i wanted to have you know one more opinion not opinion but one more research so we called it yeah, operation, yeah. operation purple pineapple no operation purple pinecone pie OPP. Okay. <laughs> that's my that's the title operation purple pinecone pie i haven't i haven't done enough of the uh of the talks about it that i got that down fluid but anyway so what happened is i went to the new zealand media and the new zealand skeptics and said hey here's this video make of it what you want she is talking about covid and mm. vax, anti-vax and they went into depth and they started doing research and so articles were written about her in the new zealand press again which only makes them go onto the wikipedia page even more and then um uh so we will update that wikipedia page and then she was making ghost claims you know that orbs you know dust oh okay yeah, of dust yeah. she's making orb claims and she had like a nine minute segment in there just talking about pictures she had taken on film i mean who uses really? film anymore oh yeah <laughs> so i asked kenny biddle who's uh, a friend of mine who's here in america who's an expert on ghost photography and he said this is the lowest hanging fruit ever this is just like basic 101 photography photography mistakes hmm. but he did he researched it and he explained how it looks like um you know what these 
dust things are. He he showed diagrams of how an object closer to the camera is going to have. I mean, yeah. he went into great depth and research for it. So that's another article that made it on a Wikipedia page. So my point is, is that this Wikipedia page, she can't touch. There's nothing that they mm. can do. And this is like, it rises up in the hits. So whenever somebody Googles this person's name, the first thing they're going to get is probably the Wikipedia page or within two or three views. Yeah. There's no slander on it. There is no ad hominems on it. It is factual. This woman, da, 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 da. And, and, you know, that's it. And so because of the efforts of all these different groups and all this communication amongst us, we're able to really achieve something more than just an article about somebody or this local group over here knows about it. It's like this, it achieves like a little more of a, a, a higher element of activism. And I think that hmm. we need to know each other. We need to be connected and, and listening to what other people are doing. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's true. Cause I mean, like, like you say, we didn't even, I didn't even know that you'd, uh, that you were going to uh, attend her, her show or anything like that until I saw the, the report that you, uh, that you made of it. But it, it also shows how, how important it is to have so many people across the skeptical community all doing sort of different things, because it means everyone can apply their own skill set to, to one piece of that, uh, of that chain. And, and especially the one where everything's online, you don't even need to be in the same town as a, a particularly dodgy lecture uh, to hear how bad it is and to, and to spread the information about how bad it is. So I think that idea of having people all turning their hand to the thing that they're most interested in, mm -hmm. we can all cover a little piece of the puzzle and, and knowing each other definitely, definitely helps that. But knowing that each other's out there to do our own pieces, I think is, uh, is really important as well, because it means that we can have such a, a comprehensive coverage of, of these claims because these claims are happening and they happen whether we see them or not. Mm -hmm. But if we see them, we can make people aware of why these claims are potentially dangerous and potentially misleading so that people aren't necessarily going to be harmed by them and put them, mm -hmm. put their, their health in harm's way by them. Adding more sunlight to them. So that yeah. leads me to, you know, to, to want to plug these other things that are going on. You know, we're in COVID now. I think mm. that it's really important not only that we need to know each other and kind of get this feeling that we, you know, we know who to connect with, like, oh, well, so-and-so is an expert on this. We go to that person. We, you know, that kind of thing. The idea that we, we need to stay together, you know, we don't, you know, you and I both have lived through the world of drama that this community has given, totally splitting off our community, mm -hmm. unfriending each other. People are just, we're barely, barely, I feel like we're starting to just get back to getting together where we're not, um, we're healing a lot of those wounds or we're bringing people in to kind of cover up for that. And if people don't know what I'm talking about with the drama that's happened in the past, that's fine. Don't know about it, but we're, we need to keep on that same path where we um, do our best to try to think well of other people. Um, you know, just try to not split us further. Let's, let's, let's keep positive and, and to, reach out like if you have a mm. disagreement with somebody let's maybe talk about it instead of tearing it into each other on social media those kinds of things and i think that also because we're able to do that we're able to learn more about each other because things aren't we can't go to conferences in qed we can't you know necessarily always go but now we do have another outlet people are doing these com these talks mm. and yeah. you know they're all over the world and if you can't go because of time zone issues you can probably access them on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this is one of the great things that uh, that I think that has sprung out in, in our side, sprung out of the, the UK skeptical community being so, uh, so open as a community and so collaborative as a community is that uh, there used to be 20, 25, maybe 30 skeptics in the pub groups regularly putting out monthly, doing monthly events in person. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously we can't have monthly events in person right now. Um, so instead, Basically, the organisers of pretty much all of those groups have decided to come together and actually produce a, a weekly event online, Skeptics in the Pub Online, which is all, uh, it goes out at 7pm on Twitch, 7pm UK time on Twitch, every single Thursday, mm -hmm. every single Thursday of the lockdown. So since like mid-March, we've been putting an event out. It's been really fantastic. And what's been really exciting about it is how people from all different groups have sort of taken up a, a little bit of uh, a little bit of the work. So we've got a fantastic tech team because we've got all the tech people from all the different groups kind of putting together a really, really uh, polished 
technical platform because they're all helping each other out and we've got the marketing team trying to get uh, get the word out and we've got people out there sort of looking for different speakers and things so we've had a, a really great run of uh, of talks um but i think also the idea of being a community what we've what we've realized is being online it takes away a lot of the barriers to entry that maybe we haven't been a very good community at all was thinking about. So we aren't always a great community of thinking, well, how do people get into, look, what venue are, are we in? And is that venue accessible? Can people who've got uh, mobility issues get in or are they going to be left out? Can people who've got childcare issues uh, access any of the stuff that we're doing or are they going to be le uh, left out? And I think that kind of accessibility is really important. And I think, you, you know, you, you mentioned about staying together as a community. And I think that's so important as well. And part of the way that we do that is by being charitable and supportive to one another. Uh, and then part of the other way is, is by making sure that we aren't um, so so attached to, to, to personality that if somebody has been particularly damaging in our community, we ignore all of the, the damage they've done in order to back them because that ends up kind of driving this big rift. We can just say, let's let's kind of believe each other and, and respect each other and kind of have a, a communal space. And I think that's one of the things we've done really, one of the things I'm really excited about with Skeptics Pub Online as well is that we have this quite um, collaborative, um, very communal, very uh, accessible space. And um, the events that we've been putting on have been really interesting, I think really, really challenging at times, but um, really exciting. And we've been able to hear from people all around the world. We had um, just last week, we had Natalia Pasternak from uh, Brazil, who's a, a fantastic skeptic doing amazing work, mm -hmm. genuinely amazing work in, in Brazil. Like under the, the coronavirus crisis, the work that her institute has been doing has been utterly superb and i think even today she's doing a, a really huge uh, media interview in uh, in brazil and she's basically been on brazilian television wall to wall since uh, since coronavirus happened and we, we got to her. hear firsthand what's happening in uh, in brazil and and it's shocking to hear from the perspective of countries who think that we're going through quite a, a bad time of coronavirus compared to others but it's nothing compared to how for us nothing compared to how bad it is in brazil so yeah it's been really exciting to to have other people that wouldn't normally get to speak in the uk kind of up on the up on the platform and uh mm -hmm. and groups that wouldn't necessarily always work together up on the platform as well so yeah it's been uh, it's been really fun and Be anyone can to... check that out yeah and it's it like i said if you have problems with the time zone well you can check them out on on youtube that's that's obviously i mean natalia and carlos are great in fact they mm. just they were just in my house a year ago and they just shared on facebook they said you know here's a time here's a it's been a year anniversary since you were in your house and it just feels ah, like okay, where in cool. the heck is that year gone <laughs> yeah yeah she, made, completely. she came over she made candy for us and she, <laughs> we went to the aquarium we went we you know we had a really great time with them they're wonderful wonderful people and yeah they what's really happening are. in brazil is insane we're we're trying to do what we can to help out um the gsow project wrote the wikipedia page for the organization in english and mm. portuguese and we've written her personal wikipedia Wikipedia page in English and in Portuguese. And then all those things she was talking about, those modalities the, that um, uh, that the government in Brazil is sponsoring, you know, is, is like, you know, dance. There was something to do with dance. I can't remember what she's telling yeah, me. Yeah. Something about dance. So I think, so my Portuguese uh, Wikipedia editors have kind of been working on these pages and it's like, be pollen. That was another one. <laughs> is, and I know you went to go, you went to Brazil too. Yeah, yeah. So I was uh, so the the oh, IQC the institute she runs. It, it was it was fantastic. So the institute they, they run the institute question of science in uh, in uh, São Paulo. Um, it uh, was it had its one year anniversary in uh, November of last year, and I was able to to, to go out. Uh, they had me come out and do several talks while I was out there. Um, but also while I was there, was I was able to sit down with their team and to talk around some of the, the things that we've done with good thinking that we found quite useful, and mm -hmm. some of the ways that we've looked at legislation and regulation, and and even brought legal cases which we've done with good thinking here in the uk that have ended up with some pretty pretty positive results and to talk about how we'd structure those kind of legal cases and what type of things we look for um and, and explain that side of things and explain how we work with the media and i know that they were doing quite a lot of stuff at the time uh, at the time and it sounds like uh since I since I was there, not because of me being there for certain, certainly because of the fantastic work that they've been doing in Brazil, um, they've really uh, they've really kicked on the activism they're doing and have done some mm -hmm. incredible stuff since then. Yeah, yeah, I'm really, really, really pleased that I know them well, and it, it felt really good to hear hear her talking on um, Thursday. I was like, mm. oh, Natalia, you know, because we communicate <laughs> over Facebook, you know, Messenger, but we don't really get a chance uh, to actually hear them talking. Like I'm talking to you. It's like, oh, this is cool. I get to actually talk to Marshall who was, so you've had some really great talks in the past. I think you're doing them every Thursday. So you're only at what, 
10 talks, something like that? 11? Yeah, I think we're on our 10th one. It's uh, something we have, like that. Uh, Covenant Synopathy this week. We've got talks coming up on uh, the history of Mormonism and its links to eugenics. We've got uh, lots of kind of interesting talks coming up. Um, and, we, and you can see on YouTube, you can see almost every one of our talks. The, the only talk that's not up on YouTube, uh, unfortunately, was Angela Saini's talk um, on her book, uh, Superior, which was about the, the history of uh, race science and eugenics and how the, the roots of that still have quite a firm hold in, in parts of science now. Um, and unfortunately, because her book, which is superb and is, is you know, selling incredibly well and uh, is kind of uh, it's going out, she's, she's just doing the paperback at the moment. It's just come out. So it was part of her book tour and she wasn't therefore able to, uh, to have us record it and have it available unfortunately but her book is fantastic and the talk was uh, was uh, one of the best we've had as well so yeah we've had some some really really fascinating talks so far it's exciting i remember we the gsw project wrote her wikipedia page in 2014 i remember because i was giving a talk and then i think she tweeted out afterwards saying that was really surreal to be listening to a talk about how i now have a wikipedia page i, <laughs> I remember that i thought Oh, nobody told her. <laughs> okay, well, that was a miscommunication. So it's fun. Yeah, so there's a lot of really great talks out there. The UK skeptics mm. have been doing a lot. Um, Victoria skeptics, the New Zealand skeptics, lots of places are doing talks now where they're starting to um, get on board. I think the UK skeptics were one of the first. Obviously, I've started doing talks mm. more in conversation instead of just like a lecture. I've got yeah, yeah. tomorrow, I'm going to be, oh, today I'm talking to, after I talk to you, I'm going to be speaking to um, Adrian Hill, one of my editors, who's going to talk about her work in the Wikipedia project. And, and mm. tomorrow I'm speaking to Paul Offit. Oh, okay, I'm excited cool. about that. I'm talking to Kyle Polish. I'm talking to Mark Edward is going to on Wednesday. I haven't announced this yet. <laughs> he's going to do readings. Oh, okay. Nice. <laughs> Since you already know that it's, it's fake, but you know, we've got a lot of different kind of things coming up. So I've interviewed a lot and I've got a lot coming up. So I hope that people should subscribe to your YouTube channel. If they know that they're not in a time zone that they could actually meet, you know, do Thursdays. Um, and yep. they should also go to your Facebook uh, page and, and to know when the talks are coming up and what they're going to be. Yeah, um, yeah. If you look for Skeptics in the Pub online, uh, on Facebook, you'll find it there. You'll, if people are, are Twitch users, you can find it on, on Twitch and subscribe and it'll kind of update you every time we go live and uh, look for it on YouTube for the, for the past fun. videos. There's some, they some they put a beer pouring sound at the very beginning. It's pretty <laughs> funny. Um, it feels like, you know, as I was saying about involvement in this grassroots skepticism, it feels like right now we're in kind of a all hands on deck kind of moment. And what I'm going to talk to Paul Offit about tomorrow is um, this idea. Now, I don't know if this is what you think, but this is what I think, that the world we've lived in with the anti-vax community, you know, the attacks, the, mm. the pseudoscience, the just the plain nonsense that we've heard from this anti-vax community all these years, as horrible as it is, I think as we get closer to this idea of having vaccine or vaccines, as Paul Offit says, he thinks we're going to have multiple vaccines, mm. maybe by the beginning of the year, I think it's going to escalate. I think what we've seen in the past, I think it's going to be on steroids. I just yeah. feel like it's going to be everybody's talking about it all the time and it's going to be ugly. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think because this time it's going to be driven by by several other factors as well. We're going to see, we, we've even seen, as, as you'll have seen in America, people uh, refusing to wear masks because it's a political stance for them. It's a cultural stance for them. And I think we're going to see that culture war stuff. Vaccines are going to be part of that, unfortunately. Um, we've seen a lot of stuff. One of the areas I've been really interested in, and uh, I want to do a little bit more work looking into, is the the way in which people end up in extremist positions from um, YouTube and uh, and social media. Uh, in particular, I did a lot of work looking at that in the Flat Earth movement, which is why I've got my Flat Earth poster on the wall there. Yeah, I saw um, that. That's great. It's flat. It is flat. It is flat. <laughs> I bought that from the Flat Earth Convention in the UK, which, which I uh, attended for a, for a weekend. Um, but one of the reasons I was so interested in the Flat Earth movement is that it's a perfect... Um, explanation of how people go from a moderate position of, of ignorance or genuine not, not knowing um, of curiosity, uh, how they get uh, radicalized into an extreme position through the, the influence of things like YouTube's recommendation algorithm and its desire to keep you engaged and desire to keep you kind of watching long enough to carry and see mm -hmm. adverts. And we're going to see that same engine driving anti-vax, I think. And I think YouTube will 
try to, to, to hold anti-vaccine content back, um, but they haven't done a very good job so far of holding back all manner of extremist content, whether it's flat earth, whether it's white supremacy, whether it's uh, online misogyny. We've seen a huge flood of all those different things um, that YouTube has, has enabled and, and actively, accidentally, but actively driven. And unfortunately, I think we're going to see that with uh, with covid deniers mm -hmm. and uh, and vaccine deniers around around this too so i think all skeptics need to be geared up to be able to to push back on this because it's going to be it's it's right there that this this is the the defining issue of our generation really and uh, and here we are ready to uh, to to help uh, push back on it yeah that we have a few months hopefully of uh you know we should be preparing ourselves and we should like you say best practices you know yelling at people arguing with them online i don't think it has anything doesn't really do anything except raise your blood pressure mm -hmm. uh, waste your time i think that we really need to be looking for opportunities to um get our best arguments in k in in there and learn how to communicate with people i don't people i don't think that people just jump into it and say oh, wake up one day, I'm an anti-vaxxer, you know, I think that you do, like you say, it's the YouTube videos that acclimate them to it with the, the algorithms, which they're supposedly trying to fix, supposedly it's better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you get in with a friend or something who kind of gives you the secret knowledge, and it's a community, a lot of it is a huge community, I've seen the vax bus and, and the people, you know, they come out and they're hugging each other, you know, the kids go to homeschool with each other. Mm -hmm. It's It's a feeling of of a community i know the flat earth is where they feel like they found their people they've been ostracized for their beliefs in the past and so yeah. now they found these other people who won't challenge them and judge them and call them stupid and yeah i think that's it i think the issue we're going to have this time when when it came to flat earth i think it was still playing out on a a level playing field to uh, while the, the algorithms were. Uh, uh, sorry, I wasn't even making a joke there. Um, but I think it was playing out on level field, playing field in, in the sense that um, that the platforms, yes, they had algorithms that were driving people in that direction, but they, there was nobody deliberately doing it. I think what I'm worried about when uh, when the, when the the vaccine deniers really take hold this time is that we know there are outside uh, outside agencies meddling with social media and meddling with uh, yes. with. D online disinformation and this will be a prime target of that because mm -hmm. anything that will help keep pe keep uh, nations in a level of chaos i sound like a conspiracy theorist but unfortunately it's true that there are there true. are external agencies that that want to c promote chaos online and this is going to be a perfect example of, of where chaos can be promoted mm -hmm. so we've we've fought it so far with the flat earth stuff we're going to be fighting a bit more of an uphill battle because there's a someone's got a, a thumb on the scale um this time so we really need to be thinking about the best ways that we engage with people how we we engage through telling stories we talk about the the impact uh at a personal level before we go to the statistics i think that's how we how we get somewhere as you talk about the people that who've lost people due to due to coronavirus and, and the difference this will make the people whose livelihoods are gone or are jeopardized and the difference this will make and, and personalize it at that level before we start looking at the bigger picture because that's how we as humans communicate is through mm -hmm. individual stories and not through numbers and not through logic the vast majority of us if not all of us i don't think we make our decisions based on logic we we justify our decisions based on logic but the things we choose to apply logic to, we make that choice based on gut instinct. Mm -hmm. we, we decide first, well, this feels wrong and therefore I'm going to look at the logic of it. But when it feels right, we don't think to look at the logic of it and because we make our decisions based on emotion first. And the second you start thinking you are a rational actor who has no emotional bias and is a purely <laughs> objective uh, person, the, is the second you'll be blind to your own biases. And we need to sort of really embrace that kind of compassion and emotion side of it because those are going to be really important tools for us to help people see what's going to be useful about the vaccines here. Totally agree. We um, here at GSOW, what we, we believe, at least what I believe, is that people do their research, in quotes, um, you know, yelling at a person or shoving your L's at them to read and, and telling them that they're idiots, I, I really don't think works. But what I think happens is when somebody's starting to get involved in something, maybe, oh, I don't know, it could be a multi-level marketing thing that just doesn't sound quite right, or um, UV radiation, or I don't know, whatever it is. Mm. I think that people are, in the, 
are starting to do maybe a Google search, maybe a quick Google search on whatever it is and think, you know, this does seem a little odd. Let me just do a look because obviously the propaganda they're seeing on the website of the of the organization or the thing is going to be totally oh no this is all totally legit just don't don't uh you know don't look at the science of it don't ask us for science yeah but, yeah. but i think what happens is you know when you do a simple google search and you're, like i say you're just starting out you're not a full believer in whatever it is you haven't completely fallen into the rabbit hole you're going to get a wikipedia page that's going to be mm -hmm. like one of the first things that hits there and so if people just read the lead of the wikipedia page and maybe the info box and that's about all they do they should be able to, within a minute of, or so of reading it, get the gist of what's going on. And yeah. if they're if they're really interested, of course, they can read through and go to the citations. But I think most people just kind of go, oh, oh, cupping. Oh, that's a pseudoscience. I thought it really meant that it was going to heal me and make me feel better. But yeah, I didn't yeah. realize that it's, oh, it's nonsense. Oh, OK, <laughs> I get it. And they leave the wikipedia page and you never hear from them again because of course they probably don't do the cupping at that point i think if we can get them early enough in their thinking i think don't hear about these people mm. that they just go in look at it and go oh okay i'm out of here um and i think that and, and as my proof um there was two different hoaxes that were out that were mega popular the blue well game and then there was this Momo challenge mm. and the Momo, uh, the first one that came out was a blue well game. It's supposedly a suicide game. I think it started in Russia, by the way. And all anybody who had school age children knew about this. It was a phenomenon. They were sending letters home with the kids, you know, for, you know, watch out for anything. If your child's drawing a whale or anything, that looks like a fish. Maybe they're going to try to kill themselves. It was just ridiculously overblown. Yeah. So it went on and on and on, and the and we we got involved. We wrote rewrote the Wikipedia page in bunches of languages. It hit millions of page views, and then it faded eventually. But then this Momo challenge started out, and mm -hmm. people were like nuts. Kim Kardashian was tweeting about it. Same kind of idea, Momo challenge. So we wrote the Wikipedia page like the first week it came out. Page views go way up and go right down like a rock afterwards yeah, yeah and i think it's because with the blue well we didn't have the time to get the page the information out there until it was kind of starting to starting to subside but with the momo challenge we got it out there at the apex and people mm. flooded the wikipedia page million over a million two two million or more people flooded that wikipedia page and i think that's what happened is people just said oh it's a hoax okay yeah yeah i got other things to do you know life is moving on and i think that if we can get the information out to these people i think i think a lot of people are going to make some pretty good decisions or at least avoid it to some extent maybe not be scholars on it but just like <laughs> oh i gotta watch that cat video <laughs> <laughs> yeah i hope so and it's those people who have only kind of a passing interest in it that i think we we have to figure out the best Catch way to, to engage with them and, and i think one of one of the one of the worries that I have with the the the, the coming anti-vax movement that we will definitely see is um, it reminds me of something I've been looking. I was researching for a long time, which is around kind of the way in which uh, people trying to push bogus products um, would uh, gain the system of of search engine optimization by buying up loads and loads of different sites. So, you know, Gorgie Berry, and there'd be a million Gorgie Berry sites, and they'd all get the people building the sites would get a small amount of money from an affiliate link. Um, so they were incentivized to try and drive as many people to their page, not because they believe in the Gorgie Berry, just because they got a very small amount of money from any referrals they sent on. And so you had the, you had websites which were just there as forums for people who would know their way around how to drive a lot of traffic to things very quickly. And they would compete to get the most traffic possible, because if you get the most traffic possible, even on the, within the Gorgie Berry space to send them all to the same referrer, you're going to get the most money of that. And so you have very tech savvy people competing to uh, to outdo one another and try and drive people. Uh, and you've got kind of a, a natural selection going on in quite a negative direction. I'm quite worried about that. But one of the things they did that was, I think, very smart and very troubling is yes, they buy up, buy gorgy berries and they buy up gorgy berry diet and they buy up those types of URLs and those types of websites. But they would also buy up gorgyberryscam.com and oh. is gorgy berry a scam? Because they know that people would Google is gorgy berry a scam and they come to their site and is gorgy berry a scam? There's a lot of people saying it's a scam. Well, actually, it's not a scam and here's why. 
and they would do that. Fascinating. So they would own the negative. This. Yeah, yeah. They own the negative SEO and spin it. And that I think is something we we again, if we've got people out there who really want to be thinking about how we uh get the most positive information out there about vaccines. Um, it's one thing to, it's, the Wikipedia stuff is going to be fantastic and the positive skeptical blogs will be fantastic, but the spaces where, you know, COVID vaccine scam <laughs> exists, that's the search terms we need to be owning as well and figuring out how we, uh, we maximize. Cause that's where people who are on the, just on the other side of the fence on vaccines, they're not the ones who haven't fully, mm -hmm. they're not the ones who don't know either way. They're the ones who haven't fully made their mind up, but are disinclined to, to take it. They're going to be looking for why it's harmful. So they're going to be Googling COVID vaccine harms, COVID vaccine side effects, COVID vaccine scam. That's what they're going to be looking for. And if we aren't in those spaces, all the people who think it is a scam and think it is harmful, they're the only voices That's that will see there. I hadn't thought of that. See, this is why I'm listening to you. I'm taking, <laughs> I'm taking notes. I talked to a woman in Oregon who uh, is actively involved in the fluoridation um, she's a scientist and mm. uh, specializing in spring water, I guess, which is why she got involved in fluoridation. But she self-educated herself in optimization, uh, search optimizations. Yeah, yeah. And so she has learned, and here's what she's doing. And again, she's too busy to take this on completely by herself. It's just way too big. I thought it was fascinating what she had. She was taking the terms for fluoridation, what it is that people type in. You know, is this a scam? Yeah. Uh, can can children have fluoridation? Is it going to harm my infant? Just all the terms that people type in. And she was actively, um, she had found a relationship with the uh, fluoridation. Um, anyway, some, some the, organ the big yeah, organizations, yeah. the dental organizations in the United States. And she was actively telling them, you need to change your algorithms so that type in will fluoridation harm my infant they get your your website and That's so exactly she was it. trying to teach them to to aim it towards these these terms and they were like oh that's a great idea i don't know what ended up happening mm -hmm. with that but the same idea is that we need to own these um people are looking for information and so we need to realize they're looking for information. So we need to make sure that the information they're getting is the best. Same, same with the Wikipedia. We say people that don't use Wikipedia, don't use Wikipedia. It's like, but they are. So mm. we know they are. So let's make sure that what they're finding is the best we possibly can. I think it's great. Let it's, me look and see what kind of questions we have. Cause I have not looked. Yeah. Afraid, yeah, no, absolutely. I'm afraid of what I'm going to see over here. Uh, <laughs> oh, gee. Oh, there's a whole bunch. I'm probably missing them. <laughs> um because i'm afraid to click on too much on my on my screen because what will happen is i'll be put in there and then the video will start playing and there'll be this audio i'm just <laughs> about, uh one of the excellent speakers the last icon mentioned that sometimes an objective numerical fact can be presented to a believer in a conspiracy there oh my gosh um okay we need to make wikipedia redirects John Donis doesn't think you like him. Uh, we are a community, John. We all need to get along. You know, somebody very famous said, we all need to get along. <laughs> Whether you like them or not, we need to find a way of working together or at least not tearing down somebody else. So I'm not gonna even <laughs> ask Marsh if he likes you or not. I'm just saying, Marsh, I'm sure is, is would anything you do with psychics, I'm sure we all need to be pushing the right direction. Yeah, we all Absolutely. need to, we're all on the same path. Let's just come along together. Um, yeah, I don't, there's 26 comments here. Okay, I'm going to click on this and see what it <laughs> says. I'm afraid that it's going to lead me to some kind of weird thing. What the heck is going on? It's taking too long. I don't know. All your questions are fantastic, everybody out there. I'm sure they're brilliant. <laughs> Well, I mean, if people want to ask me a question, I'm very easy to find. There's uh, there's lots of different ways to catch me, so you can <laughs> always uh, always drop me on somewhere else. <laughs> uh, so let me see if I got it through my list. Be reasonable. We talked about that. Oh, mention homeopathy because you were like the king of activism <laughs> in homeopathy. What's going well, on with that? 
so where it is at the moment, um, there's always lots of things going on, but homeopathy in the UK used to be quite embedded in the National Health Service. It had been there for a long time. So our, our kind of state healthcare that obviously we, we get, uh, everyone has access to here in the UK. Um, but until I started working for the Good Thinking Society, nobody in the country knew how much money was being spent on homeopathy. It was nobody's job to ask how much because all the decisions were being made in, in local mm -hmm. uh, local regions. Um, so one of my first tasks that I took on was was putting freedom of information requests into every single local council in uh, in the UK to ask how much they were spending. And we found out it was like five million pounds a year, which is it's not it's not massive in terms of a, a healthcare budget, but it's also if you look at what it could be spent on, how many nurses' salaries is that? How many MRI machines is that? How many interventions that actually work? It's quite a lot, and so that's when we started looking at the contracts that were being signed at local levels to to fund homeopathy uh, and waiting for the contract decision to be renewed. And when it was renewed, we knew that we could be there to challenge it because it was a a spend of public money. Mm -hmm. on something that the government admits didn't work and so we managed to challenge that and and now i think everywhere in england has stopped funding homeopathy there's still some funding left in scotland there's nowhere in wales and northern ireland um we started looking at how it was being prescribed on the nhs and we're pushing back against that and it's pretty soon should be added to the blacklist so it can't be prescribed we started looking at how homeopaths are regulated and whether their regulation is, is strong enough and we're starting to uh, tighten up their regulation with uh, the body that regulates the regulators so we're really trying to look at uh, a systemic level uh, as, as to how the homeopathy industry works in the UK and, and what um, what what uh, levers are there to make sure that they aren't making claims they shouldn't be making and, and having a, an effect I think. I, I'm so glad you're on our side. <laughs> <laughs> People should donate to the Good Thinking Society. Um, I think that that's a very worthwhile cause because um, it helps, you know, Marsh can't do all this by himself. I'm sure you have other employees, I hope. Uh, so I have Laura, my colleague who works with us uh, two days a week. Um, and that's that's really the team um, is Simon, myself and Laura. Um, so we get a lot done for quite a small team. Um, and so if people oh, yeah. like that work and, and want this team to carry on, they're welcome to uh, to make a small donation. If you've got a good thinking society. Or a big, org, donation. Okay or a big donation. If they want to make That'd a big donation, fine. we won't stop. It's them. a nonprofit, right? <laughs> it's, it is a registered charity. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that the, the put your money where your mouth is. Um, <laughs> oh, Rob Palmer. Gosh, I, I'm trying not to look at you guys' questions here, but Rob Palmer just <laughs> out of the corner of my eyes says, why do people with British accents sound more intelligent than people with American accents? That's that's only a function of uh, having a different accent. People in the UK listening to me speak would not think I uh, sound all that intelligent. So I've got a, <laughs> quite a, a semi-broad Northeastern accent. So it's, you know, uh, it's not, a, not a standard one. <laughs> I, think, I think that... Um, you know, I think that uh, we can't tell the difference. At least I can't <laughs> tell the difference between you all. But I guess in there, you guys do. Who is? Oh, there was a woman. Fiona Hill. Fiona Hill? Is that her name? She just testified in the impeachment oh, hearing. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. With, She's uh, from Trump uh... at Northern England. Yeah, right? yeah. She was from uh, and, not too far from where I grew up. Yeah. And she was talking about how she kind of left the UK because her accent was so strong that people couldn't take her seriously. They thought she was, you know, dumb or something. And so that's part of the reason why she left the UK because of her accent. And I thought, you sound exactly like everybody <laughs> else to me. But it's it's a thing. I mean, so I think one of the things in the UK is that the the you know the class system is is so ingrained because it is a country that is you know, the, the same population has lived here for so long. You know, we, we didn't change in, in a couple of hundred years ago. We've been largely the same for over, for almost a thousand years. And so the class system is pretty well em embedded and people come in with such assumptions and a Northeastern accent because the Northeast isn't uh, a particularly uh, rich area. It's quite, uh, quite high in terms of uh, poverty line and stuff like that. Um, people make assumptions based on your accent. And if you're in law, uh, and you're a barrister or something like that, and then people will expect certain accents from you and uh, and will judge you unconsciously. And I think this is the thing is that one of the things I think we all have to learn is that we we do make these unconscious biases, these unconscious judgments all the time based on, even if we're, we're quite aware, try to be quite aware of them, we make judgments based on how mm -hmm. people sound, how they look, where they're from. Um, these are these are things that are true about the world, the way the world works. And that impacts people's uh, opportunities. Yeah. And, Part of the job of skepticism is being aware of that and try to try to hold yourself accountable so you can say hang on did i did i just judge someone based on their accent there or based on how they look or something and um and try to try to stop yourself doing that 
absolutely it happens here in america people in the south aren't taken seriously because they mm. have a, they have a drawl they talk slower and they're you know it, it's, it's cruel but you're right we have these biases we may not be aware of them oh really quickly david powell asks are there still active homeopathic hospitals in the uk um, so there were lots of homeopathic hospitals and they were whittled down uh, years and years ago. They were whittled down to five. Um, when I started with good thinking, I think there's five or even four by that point. Since then, three of those have shut down and two of them have renamed. So they're no longer called a homeopathic hospital. They call themselves, uh, well, the London, uh, the Royal London Hospital for Integrative Medicine and the Glasgow Centre for Integrative Care. So they've taken the word homeopathy out of there. Um, in London, they shouldn't even be putting the homeopathy back in. So they shouldn't be, I don't think under the current NHS regulations, they're not even allowed to provide homeopathy there. And so they certainly shouldn't be doing that. It's just in inspiring. It is so inspiring what, what you've done. And I, and I love that we're talking about it and that you and that you do talk about this. I mean, I hear you on the Skeptic Zone in different other places and read the Good, New, Good Thinking newsletter. It, it, the ideas that you're having, the way you're approaching this, other people could do. Mm. I mean, they really yeah, could yeah. if they if they wanted to and they took this path. I mean, there's a lot to be done out there. And, you know, Wikipedia is not the only avenue. There's a lot of things that need to be done. And, and it's, it's inspiring to hear from other people. That's why we need to kind of meet more often, you know, in, in conferences and listen to other people getting up on the stage and telling us what their research is and what they've been doing and how they've done it. I learned for everybody else and also how they tried to do it and failed. At yes. Or, yeah. Yeah. They that's, ran that's into a roadblock really or this was just dumb. Um, you know, whatever. I think that's important to learn the mistakes too. So whenever I do a, an investigation or a sting or whatever, I try to even add the f problems, the things we mm. ran into, the things we didn't realize, because I'm hoping somebody's going to duplicate or at least try to to uh, duplicate the things. And you know, it's helpful. Maybe they can get around it. So yeah. we should probably get close to ending. Um, Kevin uh, Mocker has said, please make sure you give us our uh, list. Your uh, uh, Facebook and your YouTube account names. Oh, yes. Yeah. So if you want to follow me, uh, best way to do that is on uh, Twitter. I'm Mr. M. Marsh. Or if you find I'm Michael Marshall on, on Facebook, you can kind of find me there. Um, if you're interested in Good Thinking Society, um, that's on Facebook as well, as, as well as being on uh, Twitter at Good Thinking Sock. Um, and if you want to go along to Skeptics Bob Online, that's on YouTube. Just Google Skeptics in the Pub Online. Basically, if you put a search in for Skeptics in the Pub Online, you'll find that. For Merseyside Skeptics, you'll find that. For Be Reasonable, you'll find that. For QED, you'll find that. So yeah, names of the projects in all the major socials and you'll uh, you'll stumble across our work. I hope that's helpful. Fantastic. <laughs> Is there anything else that we should probably have out there we should talk about that we are because we're running up on an hour and a half and I'm sure um, we'll probably I, have to I go to the bathroom. <laughs> uh, I, think that's, I think that's everything. And, and to be honest, I probably need to have my uh, my dinner soon because it's, uh, it's, it's quite <laughs> late in, in the evening here. But um, any time, you know, we can uh, we can chat again sometimes. Is there ever anything else you want to talk about? I'm always, uh, always here, Susan. Yeah, this is wonderful. I really appreciate you spending some time with me. And thank you so much for all the work you do. Um, I Kudos, 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 kudos <laughs> to all of the amazing things you do. And as everybody always says, how do we clone Marsh? <laughs> <laughs> somebody just work on that and i, I keep going it. places and they keep threatening to kidnap me and keep me there which is oh, which is incredibly no, no. flattering but we can't do the that. important thing is it's not there's nothing special about me it's just that i've got the that i've been able to sort of spend some time doing these things there's no barrier to it it's like we say with qed it's not about the person it's about the the work and um the, the work no, that wait doing, a minute here wait a enthusiasm. minute don't go there you have management and organizational skills <laughs> and just an enormous amount of things that are not school learned necessarily. These are personality traits. And there are people within our community who, there's a small subset of people who are brilliant and could just write the best paper in the world, but they wouldn't be able to do a minute of what you're able to do micromanaging, organization, true, delegation. These skills aren't unique, is my point. That these skills but i think that they, the communities are washed with these skills and we just need people to say actually oh, okay, i can be doing right. that as well and i can i can all right i kind of agree i kind yeah. of agree but i don't <laughs> want you to diminish what you're doing because i think that what you have done is shown how we can do it and and the skills that you are have are unique and 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 very very needed and 
We well, really thank appreciate you. it. And I want to <laughs> let you know. All right. So thank you, everybody. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. I will get this up on YouTube. And thank you all for joining us and being joined by us. And until next yeah, time. Yeah, thanks very much, everyone. Pleasure Bye. speaking to you. <laughs> thanks a lot, Susan.